Welcome everybody to um, the butterfly, the spring um, identification of spring um, butterflies. Um, as I've said before, um, the Parks Trust is hosting this um, in collaboration with the um, Upper Thames, uh, get your name right correctly, the Upper Thames branch of the Butterfly Conservation Group. And um, I'm going to hand over in a moment to Nick Bowles, who is the chairman of the group, and he's going to be running the uh, presentation this evening. Um, I would suggest that everybody stays um, on mute um, until uh, Nick asks for questions. And you can always put your questions in the chat and we'll come back to um, come back to them uh, afterwards, if that's OK. All right, so I'll hand over. Oh, I should explain the reason that the Parks Trust is co hosting this is because there are a number of the members of um, uh, the staff at Parks Trust who are actually part of um, the Butterfly Transact groups. So we're also increasing our knowledge about the spring butterflies this evening as well, so that hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll be able to get out and do some IDing ourselves. Okay, so I'll hand over to Nick there now, if that's okay. Thanks very much, Amanda, and thank you very much for stepping in last minute. That's very kind. So I'm Nick Bowles. I'm chair of the Upper Thames branch, as you heard. Uh, if you have any questions as we go through, please put them into chat. And we've got a, another Upper Thames branch member, David, who's going to look at the questions as they appear in chat, and he'll alert me to any that pop up as we go through. I'll stop every now and again to take questions. There'll be a question session at the end as well, but if questions come up, I'll try and take them as they come up, because I think that's slightly better than waiting ages to hear the answer to your question. Um, but with no further ado, I hope, let's see if I can share screen. Okay. Right then. So we've got the um, title there, identifying the butterflies, the Upper Thames region spring. Parks Trust very kindly are doing this with us because every year we run a, a training session with the Parks Trust and this year of course we've got to go online. I've just made mention here of the fact that I know quite a few people who are joining this have already made a donation so thank you very much to them and maybe some of you by the end will have decided if you think you'd like to do the same. I'm hoping you will. So let's just start with what I consider to be the really top tip about identifying butterflies because people get rather hung up on looking at the butterfly and trying to work out what color it is when in my opinion what would be a better thing to look at is the wing edge and this includes any margin to the wing that you can see so the butterfly's wing usually has a solid color and then around that there's usually a white margin that, that's important and of course, the wing shape can be really helpful. Once you've noticed the edge, including the margin and the wing shape, have a look at the background color because that's usually a good clue to the family that the butterfly is in. You might want to take note of whether there's things like eye spots. Now, in addition to thinking about the edges of the wing, the shape of the wing and the basic ground color, think about the size and what the butterfly is doing. It says on the screen that the time of year is helpful. Well, we're only talking about spring at the moment, but of course, some of the butterflies we'll discuss today are gonna to be flying again later in the year as well. It's worth knowing, and sometimes people don't know this, that if a butterfly is deliberately chasing other butterflies and even things like flies or bees, then they are almost certainly male. Quite a few different butterfly species, the males and the females look quite different, strikingly different in some cases. So it's worth knowing whether you're looking at a male or a female. And in the opposite way, the females tend to spend an awful lot of time looking at plants. So they often spend their time flying around either quite low down, if that's where their plants are, that the plants are that they lay their eggs on or higher up. So you can tell quite a bit about a butterfly by what it's doing as to whether it's a male or a female. Oh, I ought to have said, and I shall say it now, I'm going to go very quickly through the first few butterflies because I think they're quite easy. And I'm also going to tell you what the caterpillars eat and where you might expect to find each species. 
So the caterpillars of the peacock eat stinging nettles and you can expect to find them pretty much everywhere. Very, very dense woodland doesn't suit them, but just about everywhere else, including gardens. And I think this species is pretty easy because there are no other British butterflies with four eyes like this. So a, a good view of a peacock, pretty much unmistakable, I think. But there are three other butterflies in the same group, which are a bit harder. So sometimes people mix these three up and all three of them fly early in the year. The comma is another nettle feeder, but it also lays on other things, including elm. So it's caterpillars eat several different plants. The painted lady eats thistles. The caterpillars eat thistles and the small tortoise shell. The caterpillars eat nettles. All of these are also found in pretty much all sorts of habitats. The small tortoise shell doesn't really like the middle of woods. It tends to be on the outside of woodlands, but all three of them can turn up pretty much anywhere and definitely in gardens. They will all be flying from now. Indeed, many of you listening have probably already seen a comma, a tortoise shell, or possibly a peacock in, from the first slide. The painted lady, as you will know, comes into this country as a migrant. So the weather at the moment isn't quite right, but the last few days were such that I wouldn't have been surprised to hear that some have arrived already. They can arrive very early in the year, January and February not, uh, months that we would say not possible. It definitely is possible. If you look at the comma, the first thing you'll see, I'm sure, is this wing shape, because we're looking at the wing edges, remember. The wing shape, which is extremely jagged and uneven. And just inside, you'll notice all these little yellow triangles. The tortoiseshell, which is the most similar looking butterfly, doesn't have such an extreme shape to the wing edge. It does have some pointy bits, but nothing like as extreme. But rather than yellow triangles, look, these are blue. So don't get hung up on the fact that it's largely orange, that the two species are both orange with black, yellow bits on them, tiger stripes across here. Look at the edges, very jagged, yellow, less jagged and blue. And the painted lady is much smoother and basically just has a black margin on the forewing, orange here. But there are none of these little triangles, either blue or yellow. So that should be easier. And this corner of the wing, black and white, is quite different, isn't it? The Red Admiral has exactly the same corner look to the wings, but the Red Admiral being black with a red stripe, very easy, I think, to spot that one. Red Admiral caterpillars eat nettles and also something called pelletry. Again, found everywhere really, even in woodlands, uh, but definitely in gardens. The underside of the Red Admiral and the Painted Lady can be a bit tricky in the sense that if you don't get to see them very well and in poor light, they're not awfully easy to tell apart, but the Red Admiral is obviously darker. One thing that is definitely true is that that same pattern in the wingtips carries through, but there are also these eye spots along the edge of the wing here and here, not quite so obvious in the Red Admiral, at least in this specimen, it can be more obvious than this. But that's one helpful hint. I mean, obviously, if you see the red stripe here, if you've seen it flying and land, that's easy. But if you just find it sitting still, these two can be tricky. So it's worth looking at these wing edges with the little eye spots on the hind wing. Now, another species that usually doesn't fly until late March, but is possibly around even now, is the speckled wood. And I think you'd see, you probably agree, I hope you would, that the underside of the speckled wood looks somewhat similar with the eye spots here. But as it says in the text, which you might be reading at the same time as listening to me, it's got a sort of crinkly appearance because of the way these veins are quite prominent. So depending on where the light is coming from, you get this slightly fluted appearance. And there is a single eye spot there, look, in a cream patch. And lots of creamy spots. So really quite a difference wing tip and edge compared with the others. Let's go back. A completely different view. There are no eye spots at all on the Red Admiral or the Painted Lady. And although the underside of the Painted Lady and the Red Admiral do look similar, 
they are different, aren't they? And I think this convoluted appearance here, this crinkly appearance is quite helpful. That is often visible, but obviously it wouldn't be on a day when there's no sunshine. And if we look at four of the most confusing species, if you only see them at their undersides, we've got the comma, which has got this very wavy outline. And it's basically two tone, isn't it? A pale outer edge and a darker inner. The tortoise shell, which has got a less crinkly outline, but it does have more bands of color. It's more obviously colored. And if that blue band there is visible on the underside, it isn't always on a worn specimen, then that is a clincher. And the peacock, which looks like a tortoise shell with the color turned down, doesn't it? So the peacock, slightly less jagged and basically less contrasty. And the speckled wood, I've just remembered that I didn't tell you that the caterpillar eats grass, various grasses, and it's called speckled wood because you tend to find it where there are trees, not necessarily woodland. I mean, you will definitely find it in woodland, but it doesn't have to be woodland. It can exist for at least for a time along hedgerows and in gardens as well. So this species, I think the best way to tell it apart is the way that the veins make the wings that slightly odd shape. Okay, now we've finished with the, um, the group which fly in the spring from the nymphalid family. I just wonder if anyone else has any questions. So David was looking and I'm just waiting a moment to see if he's gonna say yes, there are questions about that. Not so far, Nick. Excellent. Thank you, David. And that's very good. That's because I hope most people find those quite easy. So now we've got two species which could cause confusion, but probably won't. The brimstone on the left, a very pointy lemon yellow butterfly. The male is lemon yellow. Could be mistaken for the similar looking clouded yellow, but the clouded yellow is extremely unlikely to be seen before late April or May whereas the brimstone is already flying about. So this butterfly, the clouded yellow, whose caterpillars eat bird's foot trefoil and clover, this, cat, this butterfly is usually found on short grassland and often along the coast because it's a migrant and when it comes in, it tends to settle along the coast on the cliffs where there's short grass and food plants for the caterpillars. And then later in the year, they move inland to areas like ours. The brimstone lays its eggs on a plant called buckthorn, which is a hedgerow plant, grows on the edges of woods as well. And so you tend to see brimstones roaming about very widely looking for buckthorn, although this is a male, so he's looking for females who themselves are looking for the buckthorn. And one thing that you can tell if you see these flying is that the clouded yellow is a much deeper yellow. The clouded yellow looks custard yellow, I, I would describe it, compared to the lemony of the brimstone. But the wing shape, if they are settled, and intriguingly, both these species always settle with their wings closed. So you'll never see the inside when they're settled. But this one is such an obvious pointy shape that should help you distinguish it, the brimstone. Now we're getting into the rest of the whites, and I think these are probably the trickiest of the spring species. So I'll go a bit slower. Both the small white and the large white have caterpillars that eat members of the brassica family. They'll eat wide wild plants as well as the ones that grow in your garden. And both these species are referred to as cabbage whites. So the cabbage white isn't one or the other, it's both these are lumped together into what are referred to as cabbage whites. The large white isn't necessarily bigger than the small white. On average, large whites are bigger, but unfortunately you can get large whites which are the same size as small whites because the biggest small whites are as big as the smallest large whites. So size isn't really very helpful. What you need to see, and these butterflies do sit with their wings open, is the amount of black, if the wings are open, the amount of black on the wing tips. So this is a small white. And very helpfully, looking at the wing edge, we see a small amount of white. The large white has a larger amount and it's much blacker. 
Now you can get small whites with more of this dark gray than appears on this individual specimen here. So this is a bit variable in the summer in particular. You tend to get a bit more black color here. But the large white always has the black coming right down this edge of the wing past this black spot, which is known as the cell spot. So let's if we look at the small white, you can see that this gray color in this specimen, it could be darker, doesn't come very far down the wing and it certainly doesn't come as far as the cell spot. So even if it came to here, say, it, it never gets this far. So if you look at this vein that you can see running from the edge of the wing through that cell spot, a small white never has dark color as far as that. The large white always has the color coming down at least as far as that. And usually, especially in a well-marked specimen like this, even further. So their names are quite helpful. The small white has a very small amount of dark color at the tip of the wing. And the large white has a large amount of dark color at the tip of the wing. So once again, we're looking at the edges of the wings as a way of telling them apart if they're sitting with their wings open. I'll just mention briefly, I'm coming onto this in another slide in a moment, that you don't want to get worried about whether there is one spot here or two spots. There are quite a few identification sheets and uh, various identification guides that I've seen printed, which show small white and large white like this. And it leads people to think that if it's only got one spot, it's a small white. I'm afraid that isn't true. And what we need to look at is the amount of dark color on the wing edges. Small amount, large amount. This is where we see the difference between small and, uh, sorry, male and female. Both these are small whites. So this is a male small white with a single spot. And this is a female with definitely two spots and a bit of a streak here as well. And you can see, look, there is a little bit more, a little bit slightly more of a smudge down the wing, but it doesn't come as far as this vein, never will on a small white. But the sexes with all the white species can be told, with well, the orange tip is an easier way, but can be told by the single spot here for the male and more spots at least two for the female. Now you could confuse these two butterflies, which are also found quite commonly in gardens and all over the place. We already mentioned the brimstone. This is a female and I hope you can see she's not as yellow as the male. Let's go back to the male. When she flies past you, especially if she's 10 meters away, you might well think she's white. It's a very pale greeny color. And the best way to identify your brimstone female is from these pointy wingtips, because you've learned today, the best place to look to start with is at the edge of the wings. And you can immediately say, oh, that's very pointy. That must be the brimstone, even though it isn't yellow. She remember, if, if, you, if, you, if I could talk, if you remember, I was saying she'll be looking for buckthorn to lay her eggs on. So she's normally seen flying around, round about head height, around bushes. She will come down lower and she does like to feed on flowers. This is a devil's bit scabious. This is a, an autumn flying brimstone getting ready for hibernation. So she will come down to the ground and so will the male looking for flowers. But while she's looking for somewhere to lay her eggs, she's normally about shoulder to head height, possibly higher. This species, is another confusion possibility with the small white and large white. And just occasionally, very, very rarely, it will lay its eggs on cabbages, but it normally sticks to the wild crucifers rather than the brassicas. So this plant is jacked by the hedge. And this is a female because it's got more than one spot look and a streak. So this female green veined white, she's sitting on one of her food plants jacked by the hedge, and it may well be that shortly before I took this picture, she was egg laying, I don't know. But sometimes after egg laying, they will have a rest on the plant they've laid an egg on. So lots of different crucifers, 
if you've got a few weeds in your garden, there is every chance that some of those will be food plant for the green vein white and it will be breeding in your garden. Um, just the point that's on the text down here that the brimstone never opens its wings. A green vein white does, obviously, as you can see there. Looking at the undersides of these three white species, small white on the top left, green vein white top right, and large white at the bottom, one of the things we can spot is the amount of grey scales. The small white, there are none on the forewing really, hardly any on the top of the hindwing, but below the central part, quite a lot of grey scales. The green vein white has scales all over its wings, but following the course of the veins. So each of the veins is outlined with grey scales, hence its name. Why it's called the green veined white when it should be called the grey veined white, perhaps, I don't know, but anyway. And the large white has a lot more grey scales, and especially along this leading edge here near the body. So one way of telling a large white from a small white, if you get to see it, is to look at this part of the wing. Sometimes the wings are folded up and you can't see it very well. But along here from the head towards this darker tip, that is much darker in a large white than a small white. Another helpful tip. OK, now this white butterfly is pretty easy to tell from the other white butterflies because it has an obvious orange tip. Like the green veined white that we just spoke about, the caterpillars eat a whole range of different crucifer, including Jack by the Hedge that we just looked at in the green veined white. And here it's sitting on a plant which is sometimes called cuckoo flower and sometimes called ladies smock and other names as well. So this butterfly is actually a male. And we can tell that very easily, not because of one spot here in this occasion, but because it's orange. The orange tip male is very different from the orange tip female. Although both orange tip male and female share two things that are worth noting. Look at the very edge of the wing tip and around and you'll notice it's checkered. If we go back to the other species, they were just white. There's no checkering on the edges. The margin is white. But the orange tip has this checkered edge, which is a helpful tip. And on the underside, if you see the underside, it's got this beautiful pattern of yellowy scales on top of grey, which make it look green. And it's very well camouflaged at rest on a, a variety of different plants. You can I put this in because you can sometimes find out where an orange tip has been, even if you don't see the butterfly, because it lays these beautiful orange eggs like little skittles, <clears throat> which it lays on the flower stems just below the flowers normally. Now, in this picture, we can see the green vein white we already saw once before on the right hand side with one of the orange tip food plants, Jack by the Hedge. But on the left, a female orange tip. And one way that we can tell that this is an orange tip and not some other form of white is we've got these checkered wing tips, black and white checkers. But this is an orange tip, despite the fact it has no orange and it's a female orange tip. Presumably, but I'm just guessing, having no orange means it's a little bit easier for it to hide away and not get eaten by things like birds. The green vein white, I hadn't mentioned it previously. I think it was in the text, but let's just do it now. You can see that it has, like the small white, a sort of a smudge here. But then, in addition, you can see lots of little chevrons or triangles that come in along the veins. And usually including this vein below the cell spot. So that spot is called the cell spot. You'll remember that in the small white, this grey smudge ends about here in the most well-marked specimens, and it never comes down to this vein that joins the cell spot. The large white, the black, comes all the way past this vein on the cell spot, and in the green vein white, it's got these little triangles coming in along the veins, 
down to and just past this cell spot. So it's the wing edge that helps you identify these species. Margins are checkered, margins with little triangles, and then in the others it's how far the black comes down. Okay, those are the whites and they are tricky. The worst thing about them is they hardly ever stop. Did we collect any questions about the whites, please, David? Sorry, I got my screens in the muddle. Um, there was a question, but it was answered subsequently okay. about the um, difference between the sexes and the whites, which you've covered very well. Thank you. Oh, that's very kind of you to say so. I've and thank you, everybody. Sorry. Myself. I've learned a few things myself, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I doubt that. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, also flying in the spring and quite possibly within a week, people will be seeing small copper, not all of us, because the first few that come out are always quite some way ahead. It's strange that most years a few small copper are seen quite early in March and then there's a gap and the majority come out in April. But anyway, small copper will soon be on the wing. And it is an absolutely beautiful butterfly. It's got a tremendous spirit, this butterfly. It tends to perch rather like this one here sitting on a daisy. That's the underside of a small copper. And scan the surroundings for what's about. If you know a site where you've seen small copper in previous springs, you can pretty much go back to within a, within a meter of that spot and find another small copper the next year. It is astounding how faithful they are. And obviously these are completely different insects. So the small copper, the caterpillars eat sorrels and docks, probably not dock very often, but sorrels definitely of various sorts, but the tiniest plants growing in bare soil. So if you know an area where there's loads of sorrel, but the grass grows sort of knee high, waist high, I'm afraid that won't suit the small copper. But things like field margins do suit it and your garden could because I'm quite sure that anyone who's listening to this wouldn't be the sort of person who'd take their lawnmower and cut the grass every week, at least not all their grass, I'm hoping. And if you leave some bits, which you've cut very short, very early in the spring, leave some bits for weeks, then at the edges of paths and perhaps borders where the odd sorrel grows and is left alone and not pulled out by an assiduous weeder, then the small copper can breed in your garden quite possibly. It will come through your garden looking for suitable habitat, but of course, if you've got rid of all your sorrel, it will go on. But a beautiful butterfly, the males are really attentive. They'll fly out and chase off other insects in the hope that they're chasing a female. They never seem to lose hope that the next thing along will be a female. The females, much more difficult to locate. They keep themselves to themselves and fly around quite low, not easy to spot actually. They are a beautiful little butterfly and they can breed in your garden. On the same slide here, I've put the small heath at the bottom because I think there's just a possibility if you look at these two that you might think, well, they look a bit similar. Ooh, I'm gonna mix them up. No, you're not. This one doesn't have an eye spot like this. It's got lots of little black spots. This one's only got a single black spot in the eye, but look at this white streak here goes about halfway, perhaps just a bit more than halfway down the hind wing. And it separates a very dark base from a pale edge. The small copper is the other way around. Look, it's pale and then darker. So dark near the body, then an obvious pale stripe and then a gray area. So the small heath, which begins to fly in late April and which you will see flying in the same habitat as the small copper because it rather like the small copper likes areas of short grass the caterpillars eat grasses of various sorts and the small heath is less likely in your garden it cannot stand grass that gets mowed caterpillars just won't live in it they might i suppose begin to live in it and then get chopped up i'm not quite sure why but you don't get small heath in areas of grass that get mowed but you do get small heath in areas where there are long grasses and short grasses so that could be the effect of grazing animals or public pressure of people walking the edge of the path could provide the short grass that the small heath caterpillars need. So these two species could well fly together. They're about the same size, but it's this white streak here that stands out even at a distance and helps you to tell the small heath 
from the small copper. But if the wings are open, then it's definitely a small copper because small heath, like the brimstone and the cloudy jello that we spoke of earlier, never open their wings, always settle with their wings shut. Moving on, we've got two similar looking butterflies, both of them extremely scarce. I think it is 99.9% .9 certain you are not going to see these in your garden. And most of you will have to travel specifically to find them if you want to see them anywhere at all. The marsh fritillary has unfortunately become extinct in the Upper Thames area, although there are plans to bring it back to Otmore in Oxfordshire. The Duke of Burgundy is still hanging on at about four sites in Berkshire and approximately four or five sites in Buckinghamshire. It's much more common in Bedfordshire for some reason. The marsh fritillary, the caterpillars eat devil's bit scabious, which isn't a particularly scarce plant, but the marsh fritillary needs a very large area with a lot of devil's bit scabious. And by a large area, I'm talking about areas bigger than most nature reserves. That's the trouble. So most areas where we've got nature reserves with devil's bit scabious, there just isn't enough devil's bit scabious because the whole area of the nature reserve is too small. The Duke of Burgundy, the caterpillars eat cowslips and primroses. So again, there are masses of places which have got cowslips and primroses. I think it is partly because the nature reserves are too small, but it's mostly because this butterfly is so incredibly picky. The Duke of Burgundy wants to lay its eggs on very large, healthy cowslip plants, which are growing so that they get some sunshine to warm the caterpillars up, but not so much that the cowslips get desiccated. Cowslips and primula of uh, the primrose type can get dried out very quickly if we get a lot of sun and drought in the spring and then the caterpillars die because the plants aren't um, edible anymore. So these two species are both very scarce. You can tell the difference between them, although both of them have a sort of a checkerboard, because the marsh fritillary has much creamier, much more contrast in colours and it is actually quite a bit bigger. So if you see a butterfly about the size of a small tortoiseshell, probably not quite that big, then it's much more likely to be a marsh fritillary because the Duke of Burgundy is about the size of the small copper and the small heath that we looked at. So we're talking about a butterfly which is probably not much bigger than your thumbnail. This is a small butterfly. And I have been present with people who've been shown it after getting all excited about seeing such a rare butterfly and then said, oh, is that it? I thought it would be bigger. It's not, I'm afraid. It is a small butterfly, but it's all uh, just as beautiful for being a bit smaller, I think. Hard to find these. You'll need to go on a, a lead trip and we might be able to do that this summer because it sounds as though we'll be able to run our events this summer and take people out and show them the Duke of Burgundy. OK, I'm going to go on to the blues now, unless there are any questions about those we've just looked at. No questions, Nick. Thank you. Common blue and holly blue. You will get both these species in your garden, but the one that appears first in most people's gardens and the one that appears most frequently in most people's gardens is the holly blue. It isn't very large and that leads some people to say, well, it must be a small blue because it's small. But one thing we can tell uh, one thing about the holly blue that tells you it's a holly blue and not a small blue is that it is blue. We will see in a minute that the small blue isn't such a beautiful blue. Both these blue species are very similar colours. Blue, but I mean, you know, a striking blue. And when they fly about, it isn't always easy to tell. If you get a really good look at it as it flies past you, you might be able to see that the holly blue has black tips to the, the wing and the common blue doesn't, a very thin black border, but this can be quite pronounced in a female. This is a male here. The female has more black on the tips. And if you get a good look at the underside as it goes past, the common blue look has got these, they're called lunules, these little triangles of red orange. And the holly blue is white. If they settle, they are easy because we have learnt, look at the wing edges. And we look at the edge of this butterfly and it is a white margin. 
its completely clear border. Whereas here, we've got a strongly marked black and white checkered border. The hind wing is the same pretty much as the hind wing of the common blue in being pretty clear. There are some very faint veins, but you can get very faint veins occasionally in the common blue. But look at the forewing, checkered. And then if we look at the underside, if, if they're obliging enough that they sit and close their wings, this is white with little black streaks. And this is grey, not white, with black marks, each of them with a, an encircling white dot to make them stand out and this obvious red-orange band of lunules. So really quite different. Of course, if you only see them fly past at a distance, then it is tricky. But here's a, a really helpful hint. The holly blue rarely descends below head height. Holly head height. It lays its eggs on a whole number of different shrubs. So garden shrubs included. So it's very likely to be looking for the flowers of flowering shrubs. It can lay on things like Cotoneaster, even Budlia. It can lay on Pyracantha, various dogwoods, all sorts of plants. And the caterpillars do seem to survive. It's one of the few butterflies that's been able to adapt to our gardens and lots of foreign imported plants because the caterpillars are prepared to eat the developing buds and the developing seeds of a whole range of plants, but they are flowering shrubs. So this butterfly, the males are looking for the females and the females are looking for those flowers on the top of the shrub. So that's high up, above head height usually, can come down to the ground, but doesn't often. The common blue, on the other hand, the caterpillars eat bird's foot trefoil and one or two other very low growing plants in amongst short grass. Once again, if you're one of those people who I'm sure you are, has put your lawnmower in the shed, locked the door and thrown away the key, you will have an area of longer grass and around the edges of it where there might be some shorter grass. If there is birds foot trefoil in it, this butterfly will be breeding. And because that's the short grass and the females are quartering the short grass looking for the birds foot trefoil, that's where the males are looking for the female. So they're down around about ankle height flying around. They can come up a little bit higher and they can fly over a hedge if it's in the way, but they're normally down quite low. Holly blue head height. Now I did mention this in uh, passing already. These two species do look similar when they've got their wings shut. This is the holly blue, white with little black streaks. I always think it looks rather like someone has flicked their pen Whereas the small blue, it's as if they've put their pen on the wing and then twiddled it to give you a, an approximate circle. These black streaks, as you can see on the white background, are not circled white because, well, they can't be really because the whole wing is white. Over here, look at the small blue. Each of these little black dots has a white halo around it. So this is actually slightly gray. You might, when you see it, think, oh, that's white. But if you look at it more closely, it's actually gray and there are little white rings with black pupils. And even more to the point, the holly blue was blue. This is as blue as a small blue ever gets. It doesn't look blue at all, really. When it flies, it does look slightly blue. You'll think oh, that's a dark blue butterfly. But when it settles, it's actually this I don't know what you'd call it. Even navy blue seems a bit too blue a word to describe it. There can be some blue scales dusting near the body, which we can't see here because of the way the uh, photo was taken. But small blues look pretty much slate gray on the inside. Holly blues look blue. Um, and I've put it in red at the bottom because it's a very good point. Going back to the common blue, lunules. You don't get those red lunules on either species. Now, unfortunately, quite a lot of the blue butterflies have brown females, not the holly blue. The small blue, you could argue, both are brown. They're very similar in color. But of the other blue butterflies, many of them 
have a brown female to match the blue male. The common blue female normally looks like this, mostly brown, but with a little bit of blue here and there, and especially around the body. Now, this means that a lot of people can have trouble telling it from this blue species, which is never blue, like the small blue, the brown Argus. But they really are different. And I heard this described, I think, really very well by a colleague of ours in the Upper Thames branch called Graham Hawker, who said, if you imagine seeing these two butterflies, you would think the brown Argus has just put on its new dress that it's bought to go to a really posh wedding. It looks immaculate. It looks so smartly turned out, it's hard to believe that it has got such a wonderful appearance. Whereas the common blue looks like it's put on a dress that it bought for a wedding about 15 years ago and it started wearing it to work every day because it doesn't know what else to do with it. And that's really quite well observed. They just don't smack with the same punch when you see them. A few more common blues look rather drab and dowdy, which is a good idea if you're trying to avoid being eaten by something. So they don't look anything like a smart. But one really helpful hint is that in the female common blue, these orangey colored loon jewels, not as red as the brown argus, don't go all the way to the wingtip. In the brown argus they can, but they don't always. But the brown argus, because we're looking at wing edges, always, and I hope you can see them, has black veins piercing the white margin, always. I mean, unless that part of the wing has been broken off. The common blue, we saw it was the male, a clear border, completely white, no veins. There's sometimes little bits just like this edging in, but they never go right through the way that they do with a brown argus. Now the underside of the common blue and the brown argus also show differences. One is that the common blue is slightly browner, although it can look very nearly as silver as the brown argus. But the really clincher things to look for are that on the common blue, you've got a spot just here. So that's the cell spot that we talked about in the whites. Between the cell spot and the body, there's a spot there. And on the hind wing, there's a lovely smooth arc of dots. Just there, look, I've highlighted it in red. If we look across at the brown argus, and we can see these lunules coming right, they work very strongly red as opposed to orange. Then there's a space here, look, where there should be a spot. There's the spot, if it's a common blue, no spot on a brown argus, empty space. And then that lovely smooth arc on the common blue is not all that lovely and smooth, is it? But anyway, that arc on the common blue has been disrupted. It's not the same smooth shape. And we've got this figure of eight just here. So they are actually relatively easy to tell apart if you get a clear view or a, pi a clear picture. And once again, we can see the veins going through the margin look. Whereas here it's completely plain. There's a hint, but it's it, the, they're not veins so much as just slight folds in the wing. OK, now by the end of April and into May, you might be faced with this delicious problem. You might see a butterfly and think you've seen an Adonis blue. By and large, I think it'd be fair to say that if you think you've seen an Adonis blue, you haven't. Because unless you're dancing around in a wild frenzy, screaming at the top of your voice that I've seen one, I've seen one, I've seen one, then it wasn't an Adonis blue. They are electric blue. They are startlingly beautiful, absolutely wonderful butterflies. And lucky for us, we can tell them quite easily from even the most brightly marked common blues because we've learned to look at the wing edges. And we remember that the common blue has a clear border of pure white, but the Adonis look has veins, just like the brown Argus. You've got all those veins coming through. So if you see a startlingly blue butterfly and it has black veins through the border, the white border, then it 
could be Adonis Blue, but you'd have to be in a pretty special place to see it. The caterpillars eat horseshoe vetch, so you're on chalk downland really, and the best quality, fairly short turf, otherwise the Adonis Blue can't live there. But they are becoming more widespread in our three counties, so you could see them on chalk in any one of the three counties. If we look at the undersides, unfortunately they are very difficult to tell apart from the undersides, but we have to go to the edges where we see a clear border in the common blue, just white, and there are veins obviously piercing the white border. This picture isn't the best, I'm sorry, I haven't got all that many pictures of Adonis blue because I don't see it very often, but there you can see the black veins going through the border of the Adonis blue. So it's the wing edges once again that gives you the clue. Right, well, we've, we've looked at the blues. Um, any questions? Blues often seem to flummox people. Oh, I think they're quite straightforward. But what have we got there, David? Any questions? No, you've uh, been very right, clear, I'll, Nick. I'll sail on. Either clear or I've scared everybody away. Let's no, carry on. very attentive. Oh, well, I can't see that, you see. I can only see my own screen, which is probably a good thing. Um, right, uh, we're into the skippers. Now, these little beauties will be flying around. Usually the grizzle skipper comes first from March, certainly early April. But late March, I would think the grizzled skippers will first appear. And then through April and definitely in May, there will be quite a few of these about on the best chalk downland sites. Rather, as I said about the marsh fritillary and the Duke of Burgundy, when I said they can be fussy and in particular the Duke of Burgundy, the grizzled skipper feeds on such a range of plants, you'd imagine it would be immensely common. The caterpillars can even eat bramble. They normally feed on agrimony and wild strawberry and one or two tormentils, but they have to be growing pretty much surrounded by a patch of bare soil. And this is because the caterpillars can only digest their food if they're warm. Remember that they don't make heat for themselves. They only get their heat from the ambient air temperature. So if they're able to be feeding on a leaf, which is by a patch of bare soil, and the bare soil heats up in the sun, it radiates heat to the caterpillar and the caterpillar can digest its food and it can deal with some pretty tough things like bramble leaves. But it needs to be a fairly small leaf, whatever the plant is, next to a patch of bare soil or the caterpillars just don't get warm enough and they don't complete their development. And that's why if your garden's like mine, you might have a bramble patch in it that you wish wasn't there because it got a lot bigger than it was ever supposed to but you never see a grizzled skipper. And in my garden, I've got strawberries, but I never see a grizzled skipper. You have to have a fairly large area of relatively rough grassland. It could be in a woodland if there's very wide rides. It could be on the edge of a farmer's field if he's got some really good field margins, but it's got to have the food plants for the grizzled skipper growing in extremely short turf with bare areas. So somewhere where the rabbits have been doing a lot of digging would be quite good. And the grizzled skipper is really suffering, I'm afraid, from this need for this disturbed soil because it's a bit rare to find areas with disturbed soil these days. Grasses grow so quickly as a result of nitrification of the soil that they tend to smother bare patches very rapidly. And the grizzled skipper can't cope with the grass because it shades the caterpillars, they get too cold and die. The dingy skipper does a little bit better. It doesn't need quite such bare conditions, but the dingy skipper lays its eggs, its caterpillars eat bird's foot trefoil. And you can find the little orangey yellow eggs on the top of bird's foot trefoil leaves, again, in areas where you've got some bare soil. But we're not talking about a great big patch. It could just be a, a really tiny bit of bare soil by the side of a bird's foot trefoil plant. So if you can find some of those little, um, leaflets of bird's foot trefoil spreading out across extremely short turf where the, some of the leaves are across bits of bare soil and you look closely in May, you might spot the little yellowy orange eggs of dingy skipper on top of them. Both these species, a bit tricky to spot actually because they're so small, many people would think 
they're not butterflies, they're too small. So we're talking about very small butterflies, which have an ability to fly at tremendous speed considering how small they are. And they zip about so close to the ground and they manage to turn corners on a sixpence, if anyone remembers what a sixpence was, uh, which means they can be lost from sight very easily. So you see them zoom away from you when you walk towards them, you scare them up, they zip off and that's it then, you don't see them again, they take a turn and disappear. But if you stay still, if it was a male, it will probably come back to where you were. I find it's often a very good idea. If I scare one of these things off, I'll do something else somewhere else on site for a few minutes and then cautiously come back to where I think I saw these butterflies. And they've usually gone back to the same spot because the males take territories. The females won't do that. Uh, if, if you scared a female off, I'm afraid that's it, she's gone. But the males do come back. So it's worth retreating to the space where you saw them. One more thing about them that's worth knowing, if you go out on a day that's cloudy and you might think you're not gonna see very many butterflies, but if it's a site where these species are known, look at the top of, <clears throat> excuse me, look at the top of the stems of plants like marjoram, where they've got the dead heads from the flowers of last year. And the grizzled skippers sit really obviously right on the top so they fold themselves into the typical butterfly at rest shape, a little triangle, and you can spot them quite easily on the top of the seed heads and last year's flowers, uh, yeah, dead flower bits of plants like marjoram. Doesn't have to be marjoram, but marjoram is one it seems to like to sit on. I think the colour scheme suits it, it blends in. Whereas the dingy skipper has an even more bizarre way to roost. You can find them like this in the evening, not just on uh, overcast days, but if you look at the seeds, the seed head of knapweed plants, they wrap themselves round. So this isn't basking in the sun, this is a butterfly roosting. It doesn't roost by folding its wings like the grizzled skipper, it actually wraps itself around the old seed head. And from a distance they are very difficult to spot. You perhaps can't see it so well in this picture as I've seen it on a a few occasions when I found a butterfly, but they look a lot like the seed head of a knapweed. So those are the only skippers that fly in the spring, very small, hard to spot. I think you'd be able to tell them apart if you saw them because this one obviously is checkered, black and white, well, very dark brown and white. And this one is in bands of various greys and browns and sort of a sandy color. But beware, because also flying in the spring are some look-alike day-flying moths. So it is quite possible that you will see in the same sort of habitat, this is quality grassland with lots of different plants in it, where the turf is low, not as a result of mowing, but as a result of just very poor nutrient status to the soil, so that the plants grow in really quite bare soil conditions, there's a certain amount of bare ground around. You can also find the Mother Shipton day flying moth. And if you don't know, I'll just try and point out where Mother Shipton is here. So we're looking at her face here. This is her long nose, there's her eye. And down here, there's her open mouth and her sticky out chin. Mother Shipton was a witch who lived in Nasborough. You could look her up on the internet. And people were convinced she was a witch because she was ugly, which must have proved that she was a witch, mustn't it? And the fact that a moth had her face on its back, well, you couldn't really ask for better proof than that, could you? But for some reason, they didn't burn the witch. She was a bit of a local celebrity. So that's Mother Shipton moth. I think you can see that it's not the same pattern when it sits still, politely like this, and doesn't zip away from you. If it flies away and you scare it off, you will have very little very little chance of telling these two apart, but if it sits still, that's obviously a very different pattern to this. These two are a bit similar, I have to confess, but what you will notice when it flies, these orange hind wings on the Burnett Companion do make it really quite obviously not a dingy skipper. So the four wings, yes, I can see that you might have trouble there because you've got the same bands, look but the hind wings really make it clear. And in fact, 
One of the problems you might have if you go looking for Duke of Burgundy is that when the Burnett companion flies away, it looks quite orange. So you might think, oh, was that a Duke of Burgundy? So look carefully at your Dukes to make sure they're not Burnett companions and look very carefully at everything you think is a dingy skipper to make sure it's not a Burnett companion. OK, that's the end of the skippers. Didn't take long, did it? There's only two. Did we get any questions about skippers, please, David? No, we didn't. Nick? Oh, well, either I'm doing brilliantly or dreadfully. It's hard to tell, isn't it? We're coming on to our last butterfly now, one which should be a dead cert for identification because it's the only green butterfly that we have. There are some green moths, but they never sit in this position. So wings together. So what we have here is another butterfly that has this strange thing that it never opens its wings when it settles. It obviously opens its wings to fly about, but like the brimstone and the clouded yellow, this butterfly never opens its wings. It always settles to show you this lovely green color. Absolutely beautiful. The amount of white little spots here, which trace a line across the center of the wing, that can vary from almost nothing to a almost solid white line. But if it's a green butterfly with this sort of orangey margin, then that is a green hair streak. And you can't really ask for anything more beautiful than that on a, a nice April's day when you go out for a walk and you see one of these. They're a bit tricky to find. The caterpillars, rather like the holly blue, are adept to eating all sorts of things. Um, quite often on chalk grassland, they'll come down and lay their eggs on bird's foot trefoil and one or two other plants right down there in the grass. If the grass is growing in very sparse, sorry, if the plants are growing in very sparse grasses, but if the grass is a bit thick, if the soil is quite nutrient rich and the grasses are rather thicker, then the plants are not going to be much used to it down there for the same reason as the grizzled skipper couldn't cope. It's too shady and too cool. And then it lays its eggs on things like um, dogwood and sometimes one or two other bushes too, spindle and so on, where the eggs eat the developing flower buds, just like holly blue. And it's a great shame that like the holly blue, this hasn't managed to come into gardens and use a whole variety of different plants in gardens. But unfortunately it hasn't, and it's stuck with our native plants. So you can find this butterfly right through our three counties, but they're a bit tricky because they're really good at sitting motionless at about perhaps two meters high, two and a half meters high, up on the green foliage where they blend in very well and they won't move, the males will sit there until they think they've seen a female fly past when they'll dart out and look for them. But because they're very dark brown on the inside of the wings that we can't see when they're settled, they look like a small dark insect zipping out. And you might not realize it's a green hair streak because it doesn't look green in flight. But the thing to do if you do see something zoom off from a bush above your head, is just wait because like some of these other butterflies we've talked about, the males are territorial. They will come back to their favorite bush and sit on it. Um, in some places, it's a good idea to go out where they are well known because then you'll know that, well, the butterfly is here and it's just a matter of looking at every bush until you eventually see one. But I think it's quite a nice challenge to go to places where they're not known. I think this butterfly is probably much more widespread than we record it just because people don't hang around bushes, <laughs> perhaps for obvious reasons, but people don't hang around bushes just hoping a green hair streak might be there. I think if we were to look, we'd find them on the edges of woodlands, copses, and in areas which are scrubbing up bits which have been perhaps left because they're earmarked for development, but nobody's built on them yet. Those sorts of places are the sorts of places this butterfly could survive. It can lay its eggs on a whole range of different food plants, but it's a bit tricky to spot because it doesn't fly about very much. OK, we've been through the butterflies. Before I take questions, I'll just show people something about recording what you see. Now, I'm a great advocate of a smartphone app called iRecord Butterflies. And when you first put this into your phone, you have to give it a little bit of information about who you are. And I would advise that it's a good idea to let it see the GPS information from your phone. It saves you a lot of work. Once that's loaded, 
you get a page like this. And if you've seen a single butterfly at a place, then you can just press on this and it will take you through to record a single butterfly. But if you're in a fairly good habitat and you're seeing several things, even in your own garden, you might well see several butterflies, different sorts in a day, then you can click on survey an area. And if it's a case that you've seen something, but you weren't sure what it was, you might prefer to go to the butterfly guide at the bottom first to look at the pictures and see what you've seen. Anyway, let's suppose we've chosen to survey an area. We get taken to this page and we can put in here the name of the nearest village or town. And then we can, if we want, we can add that to site favorites. If we go there regularly, we can keep it stored and we can choose what sort of scale we're recording at. The GPS will tell you where you are. So if you've allowed that, you'll get a little map will pop up showing you where you are. And you can use that location, saves you a lot of faff in trying to work out where you are by putting the pin on the map yourself. If it doesn't locate as successfully as you wanted, try reload my current location. You might need to do that a couple of times, depends how good your, your signal is when you're out in the countryside. And then that will take you through to record the various things you've seen. Now, add species to survey will bring up pull up this one as well, a whole load of butterflies. Now, what this app does, which I think is really clever, it knows what was seen in that approximate location on the same date in previous years. So if you're standing in your garden, for instance, and you pull up this app, it will tell you what people have seen around about your garden, or it might even be your records in your garden in previous years on that day in terms of the most frequent at the top and then going down the page less and less frequent. These numbers are because this has already been filled in. Someone has said, I've just seen a small tortoise shell followed by a small white and a comma and then a brimstone and then a peacock. But when you first open it and it comes up like this, it's telling us that this is the order that the app expects you to see the butterflies. And that's quite a good guide because if you're struggling, oh, was that a small white or a large white? Well, the fact that it's more likely helps to point you perhaps in the right direction. But don't always assume that it knows what it's talking about. Sometimes you'll see things that the app doesn't suggest, but it is very helpful. And then if you're still not quite sure, you can go into the butterfly guide and look at the pictures. And if you click on each of these, you can get a lot more detail about what the food plants are, what time of year they fly and so on to help narrow things down. So we might have been wondering was that a green veined white or a small white and it brings up the information you can have a map to show you where it flies and all the rest of it really helpful little app goes into your smartphone for free and when you've filled it all in and you've clicked submit at the end of putting the data into it that all goes off and gets stored in the national database another really similar way of recording is if you prefer to write things down in the field and then go home and put them in through your uh, PC or your laptop at home, then you can use this portal for recording butterflies. And some people prefer this because one, they like sitting down at a proper computer to do it or their laptop with a cup of tea in the evening rather than out in the field where sometimes the sunlight shining on the screen makes it tricky. This allows you to record Record the different life stages much more easily. So with the previous app, you can always go into the iRecord um, system. You can log in and get yourself registered and you can go in there and you can add extra details later. But this one, you can add it all in at the time that you input things. But this is slightly harder in that you've got to find yourself on a map. So if you use your phone, the phone does it for you if, if you've allowed that feature. If you use this on your PC, it's down to you to know where you've been and put little pointers on the map but not too difficult. If you see lots of different things when you're out in the field, and most of us do, we don't just see butterflies. You might, for instance, see dragonflies. Then you can use this program, iRecord, which is the sort of mother of all those other programs. It records every single thing that you've seen that was alive. And you can put them in by choosing the different groups. So you could put your butterflies in using this program, and your dragonflies that you saw that day and your earwigs that you saw that day and the birds that you saw that day and the plants that you saw that day, etc. 
Um, and we are having a session about this. Hello, where's that come from? We're having a session about this, recording butterflies and moths on the 18th of March. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about how to go out and see butterflies and then record them so that all this gets logged and used in the interests of conservation, then we're having a session then. And that's it, thank you. So, as I say, I hope it's been interesting and useful. Um, I'll take any questions that we've got now. Thanks, David. Yeah, we've had um, one from Lisa Ward, or I think that's um, Lisa Se Seward, Seward yeah. um, asking about species later on in the summer, I think. So asking, well, Lisa could probably ask a question herself, but she says, have trouble identifying a meadow brown versus a small heath. Any tips? And also a question about um, large and small skippers. Okay, well, there is a separate um, presentation about that, which I don't know whether there's still tickets available, but there may be. So let's go, I'll go back to share my screen. Come on. And let's find the picture with a small heath. Where's it gone? The best way to tell your small heath. Can you see this, David? Yeah. Good. Here's a small heath, look, Lisa. And I hope you can see it's got this streak right in the center of the wing, the hind wing. The meadow brown is not dissimilar, but without that streak. The meadow brown's slightly larger, but not massively so in every case. So the best thing is to look for that streak. If you can see that little white streak, then you are definitely looking at a small heath. The meadow brown is sort of two-tone, darker near the body and then gray brown on the edge, but it's not as contrasty and there is no dividing white streak. That's my top tip for meadow brown and small heath. As to the skippers, the large, small and Essex skipper are tricky partly because they're so small. And I think it'd be best if we do that in a separate presentation because I've got no pictures set up for that this evening. Yeah, I think they are tricky, aren't they, Nick? I think it's a good tip is to sort of learn them through the season because then you... Absolutely, yeah. Often with identifying things, it's knowing knowing what you don't know almost. And yes. You get familiar with some things and then keep adding to it. Um, another question, well, Laura helpfully says that on iRecords, you can download a copy of your data um, so if you use the app and submit it, you can then go to the website to get a copy of your data yes. again. Yes, get all your records back out. That's absolutely true. Um, I think it's true if you've used the any of those systems we just looked at, you can still get your records back from all those three systems. Yeah, it's a good way of keeping all your things in one place. Um, Terry Ganaway asks, why is the cell spot so called? That's a very good question. And I, <laughs> do you know, David? I've got no idea. I know it is called the cell spot. There is a cell there. I don't, perhaps if we look at one of the white butterflies, we'll see what we're talking about. No, it's not obvious in this picture. If you were to look at a picture of a butterfly's forewing, that's the front wing, there is an area where the veins branch here and create a space in the middle. And that's called the cell. And the spot is in that bigger space between the veins, but quite why it's called the cell spot, apart from the fact that it's in that region called the cell, I can't think. It's probably no, as simple probably as that, no. but it might not be. No. Sorry, you found a hole in my Norwich. Well, well done. I'll have to go and look that up later. Yeah. Um, then there's a question from Diane Lester, whether the recording can be accessed for future reference. And well, similarly, yes, Tricia asked whether there's a copy of the slides that would be made available. Well, assuming that Amanda worked it properly and she was hoping she had, then this is all going to be recorded and put up on our Upper Thames branch website. So you'll be able to download it as a video and just pause the video when you want to look at a slide. So the answer is I hope it hope it's yes. Uh, but. I was part of a Zoom meeting last month where somebody realized that they thought they'd pressed record at the beginning, but then accidentally pressed it twice. And so they'd started it and then stopped it. Um, but we will find out later is all I can say. Have a look at our Upper Thames Branch website. And if we have been successful, 
it will be displayed there. Great. And then Tracy Jessen asks, last year I didn't see many tall, small tortoiseshells. Is there anything we can do to encourage them in the garden? It's, well, you can encourage them into the garden with flowers for them late in the summer. Uh, but to get them to breed, you do need a fairly extensive patch of stinging nettles which face to the south and get nice and warm. And most people's gardens aren't really big enough that they can afford to give over a big sunny south facing part to stinging nettles. So if you own a very big patch of land, you could definitely do that. You could have stinging nettles that you grow just to feed the small tortoiseshell. So they need to face they need to be on a slight slope facing south or southwest rather than a steep slope, a slight slope. And they need to be sort of undulating. That is to say, you don't want them all to be even height. And one way that you can achieve getting them to breed more successfully is to go in when the nettles have been growing for about a month or so. Go in and take a pair of shears and cut a hole in the middle of your nettle patch. And as those nettles regrow a bit lower than all the ones around them, they'll be nice and sheltered from the wind by the taller nettles. And those low nettles with that young growth coming back will be perfect for small tortoiseshells and they'll lay eggs on it and you'll have caterpillars everywhere. Um, but as I say, it's not really something that most of us have got a garden that's suited to it. And some of us have got partners who don't think growing a great big patch of stinging nettles in the garden is what gardens are for. So that's a tricky one, but you can definitely feed the adults that have managed to find nettles elsewhere. If you have the sort of flowers that flower in late summer that they like, things like um, Verbena bonariensis, the Budlia, um, a whole range of plants really, which are fairly common. And then perhaps even later in the year, you could go for things like Michaelmas daisy. But a lot of tortoiseshells have already gone to hibernation by the time things like Michaelmas daisy and the sedum come into into flower yeah. answer the question i hope that was very yeah good answer um and chris poed on the uh, topic of nettles um says he gets net comma eggs laid on them so it's a, it is a good nettles are a good stinging nettles are a good food plant for a few, yep. few of the very species. good i mean even the painted lady will lay on stinging nettles and a whole load of moths and lots of little beetles live in nettles and nettles are absolutely fantastic. The trouble is that um, I don't know what it's like where you people live who are listening to me, but some councils not far from where I live are rather too fond of going and cutting the nettles down because people complain about their kids falling into them and getting stung. Um, hopefully councils are becoming a little bit more aware of the, the need to leave things like patches of nettles alone if they grow by the side of a path. I hope so but they're very good definitely agree with that uh did i hear you ask about painted ladies that there was an influx last weekend i think well i didn't Coast. actually i did say i didn't know oh that's interesting thank you i'll have to have a look at the old migrant moth website and pick up on those yeah um and yeah no more questions other than uh carol gibson points out the recording species is very helpful for planning applications yes um because developers need to take account of biodiversity in their plans and if there isn't data then it's um uh you know it affects yeah no, it, affects if, decisions made about if, if there are no if there's no data of anything having been recorded the assumption is that nothing lives there which is obviously erroneous but that's what they what they'll argue um it's a very good point um i regularly get asked to go and look at bits of land after a planning application has been lodged and that's always a bit too late so i went to a site recently where there were lots of lovely elm trees which probably had white letter hair streak and other rare things unfortunately the people had waited until the groundwork had already been done before they invited me in so there was absolutely no way to stop this development and a, a, a huge length of hedge was removed because the developer of this particular site took the hedge out to make the access road where the hedge was um, and it was a real shame because I'm pretty sure there were white letter hair streaks and no doubt on the site there were other things too but despite it being in the middle of a village nobody had ever recorded a single thing 
on this large plot of two big fields that had been grazed with cows for millennia, perhaps. Uh, everybody just assumed it would always be there. And then one day they discovered it wasn't there anymore. A bit late, they asked me to go in. So I would advise everybody who can to record everything they see, because it's the only way you stand a chance of getting any sort of mitigation when planning applications are put in is to know that there is something there that's worth saving. And then the developers will make a big effort. Um, there are examples, I won't go into details, but in Oxfordshire, we've got a site where the developers have created a very large wildlife refuge because such rare things were there. And luckily we knew about it before the planning application was approved. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, there's lots of support for, well, there's a, a thank you from Tracy for answering her question and lots of people saying thank you for the talk and uh, how interesting it was and um, thank you for the good tips. But I think that's it for all the questions. All right. Um, well, I certainly don't want to keep people after they've decided that now's a good time to go off and get their identification guide out and just mug up on a few of those tips that I've given them. So I'll repeat my thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Parks Trust for um, facilitating all this. Thank you very much to the Parks Trust, Amanda Bailey in particular, for starting the, the meeting off. And with any luck, we've got a recording of it down to her skill. Um, thank you, David, for manning the chat room there for me. Thank you for everyone who's listened. It's very kind of you to log on in the first place and to listen. And those of you that made a donation, thanks again for that. That's really kind. And we hope that we're going to get enough donations to pay for some decent conservation work on the back of all this. That's the, the whole point of it is to get conservation as an output from these sessions. So thanks very much. Actually, before you go, Nick, there is a question about where do people make a donation? Um, OK, well, the site that was mentioned, and I forget precisely where this appeared, but probably on the event right page. But if you go to the Butterfly Conservation website, there's a campaign going on there which you can um, subscribe to. So it's Butterfly Conservation website. Is that the main Butterfly Conservation Yes, website? the national one. Yep. We're, we didn't think it was um, worth setting up a separate fund for our local branch. So it's all going into the national, but they, of course, do work, as you'd expect, nationally. So we will get some redress from that eventually. I'll just paste the link into the chat for those who can't Oh, thank you. It, but... Well done. It is definitely on yep. some of the flyers for this. There were links to it, but I'm, I must admit, I can't remember which ones had the links. It's called Combat the Crisis. That's, That's the, it. Yep. Yeah. Somebody also posted the full link, which very much. Thank you very much. That's thank it. You. I think I've been, yeah. Lovely. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Nick and David. That was really, really informative. And uh, I certainly learned loads. 